Documentary Photography, Exploring a Policy for Use in the Cultural Exhibitions and Museums. So this information issue boils down to a single question. In the United States, when and how can a cultural museum or, and exhibitions incorporate documentary photography of copyrighted works they don't own? So we need to understand a few terms in order to get to this issue. One, what is documentary photography? Documentary photography is the taking of pictures with the intended purpose to represent them as faithfully as possible. Copyrighted works are aesthetic or physical items or artistic creations that are under protection by the United States copyright law. And finally, a museum or exhibition is any institution that is attempting to show a cultural works for purposes of educating the public. So what institution did we study? We looked at a small historical museum in the western United States. It has a reconstructed fort, classrooms, exhibit halls, and a gift shop with self-published books. The typical exhibits include historical objects, photographs, documentary photographs of exhibits they've had in the past, archival material from local historical figures, and most of their artifacts are from Native Americans, U.S. Army, traders, mountain men, and immigrants. It's important to note that they asked us not to name them publicly, and since this is a public YouTube, we can't actually mention the name of the institution. So how did we go about this research? We collected a number of materials from a number of different places. We did a, a number of stakeholder interviews, including creators, rights holders, photographers, curators, directors, and philanthropists. We then also collected court cases, news reports, we did a literature review, and we collected museum policies to review. We took all this research material and we used a qualitative coding method using grounded theory and a software product called Deduce. From that we discovered a bunch of themes and, and concerns within those researches, research by evaluating um, the, the coding. And finally we developed a policy we thought would, that would best accommodate the mass number of concerns. So who are all the stakeholders? Well, creators are stakeholders, rights holders, documentary photographers, curators, museum institutions, philanthropists, the United States government and courts, copyright trolls, and the public. So creators are individuals who create the artwork, but have probably sold it to somebody else and they don't retain the rights anymore. A salience analysis of creators tells us that they're dependent stakeholders. They have legitimate claims to natural rights over the material because they created, they're the artists and they created the work in the first place. And they have urgent concerns about how that work might be presented or used in the future. But in fact, they have no real legal power. The copyright law has removed any rights they have once they've sold the work. Their primary concern is receiving credit for their work. They're very concerned about getting credit for their work and they wish to control the context in which that work is being used in the future. They don't have a lot of economic concerns because they've sold the work already and they don't really understand copyright laws so they're confused so they only have a sense of natural entitlement. I made this work therefore I have some rights over it. Rights holders on the other hand are people who actually own the copyright to these cultural works. They often loan these works to museums who then photograph them for documentary purposes but they're, they own the works outright themselves. These are definitive stakeholders. Um, they, they, they believe they have legitimate claims of, because they have ownership. They own it, so they have legitimate claims. They have urgent demands because, again, they own the work and they have the right to how that work is being used, or they believe they do. And finally, they have legal power. Because they own the work, they have the, they're the ones who have the standing to sue. They're generally not economically driven when it comes to non-commercial educational uses of, of their work. Um, they've loaned the work to museums so that it can be seen and so that it, they're not as concerned about making money. Uh, they have low concerns over infringement, and but they do have high concerns over receiving credit for the work. They also want to be credited as someone who owns the work, and they insist on having being asked to use that work in the future. Documentary photographers are the ones who actually take the documentary photographs of the original works in the first place. And they're demanding stakeholders because uh, they're not considered to be legitimate under the law. The law has determined documentary photographs are copies. They have no rights. 
They've signed contracts to give up the ownership as well. So since they took the photograph, their contracts often give up the ownership and the negatives. So they don't even have the power to use the photographs in the future. And finally, their work is um, very urgent. They're, they're always being asked to take photographs. They're always, their work is being reused all the time. They have urgent concerns um, in terms of being timely. Their concerns are mostly how their work is also being used in the future. Where are their photographs being shown? They have, a do, again, a high degree of concern over receiving credit for the photographs they've taken. But again, not a big future long-term economic concern because they've been paid to take the photographs. Curators are people who are responsible for putting together museum exhibits in the first place. They're the definitive stakeholders as well. They have a legitimate reason for needing to know or be dealing with this material because they create exhibits. They're, they run on urgent, tight schedules when they're trying to create these exhibits and have to make decisions quickly. And they have the power because they actually have the photographs in their possession and they can use them if they want to or not, if they have rights or not. They have a very low concern about infringement because they feel like they're entitled to use photographs under educational use. And they have a high degree of concern about keeping the cultural works available to the public so that that's why they've taken documentary photographs of loaned work in the first place. The museum institutions themselves are slightly different than the curators in that they're the legal representatives of the museum. They're trustees, owners, they're people who have direct legal responsibility for the museum. They tend to be dominant stakeholders. Um, their mission is to display cultural works and so they have a legitimate cause to deal with documentary photography. And they have the power to display this work because they have money and they have a mandate and they have a physical place to display this stuff and they have the, the photographs in their possession. However, they have little sense of urgency to deal with any of these issues as long as the public attendance of their institutions is good. So they don't act unless there's some problem with the number of people coming in their institution. Their concerns are primarily around making sure that the public has access to these cultural works. Um, and they do this by taking documentary photography and using that photography in future exhibits. The interesting thing is, is that when they are rights holders, so when they own the work, they behave more like rights owners. They don't want people profiting from their work. They want to control it and they want to receive credit for the work when they own it and loan it to other institutions. Uh, they have a low level of concern for being sued for copyright because, again, they feel like they have a privilege under educational use. And finally, they were concerned enough about their public image and being sued that they asked us not to use their name. Philanthropists are the people who fund the whole institution. So generally they have a vast amount of resources and they give those resources to institutions to put on cultural exhibitions. They're dormant stakeholders. Um, nobody legitimately asks the philanthropist whether or not that someone can use a documentary photograph and nobody believes they should have a say. However, they have a lot of power because they fund the whole enterprise. They have a lot of resources. They use that money to fund exhibits. But they only ask, they only act when they're asked. They don't act with any urgency at all. They only act when somebody asks them to. Um, in fact, the philanthropists we interviewed, the first question they asked is, do you need any money? Their primary concern and only concern is making sure that there is a cultural commons that people can see cultural work and heritage with. They don't care about any other issues. The governments and courts are the legal representation of the law. They're the ones who create the policy and have the power to enforce it. They're dominant stakeholders as a result. They're legitimate because they have the legal right to interpret copyright law, and they're powerful because they have the sole right to be able to, to grant infringement cases. However, they only act when, they're, when people are suing. So they don't act proactively. They only act when, when pushed to. They've expressed two primary concerns in the, in the form of court cases. In Bridgman Art Library versus Corel, the courts determined that documentary photography is not an original work. There's no spark of originality that documentary photographs are purely copies. Second, they ruled that copyright trolls don't have any legitimate standing. So in Wrighthoven versus Wayne Hoyne, they indicated that copyright trolls can't sue because they have no rights. Which brings us to copyright trolls. Copyright trolls are individuals or organizations that sue um, f regarding the rights of cultural works. So they sue infringement, but they don't actually own the rights to any of these works. They only sue on behalf of people. 
And they're the most dangerous stakeholder in the game. Uh, courts have ruled they have no legitimate standing, so they really don't have any legitimacy. The problem is, is they have the power to sue people. And since they have the power to sue people and the resources to sue people, um, they can extort settlements from individuals. Um, they are urgent because when you're being sued, you have to respond. They've indicated they purely have their own economic concerns in mind. Uh, they don't even own the rights to these works. They're only concerned about making money. They often claim to be concerned about the economic rights of others. If you read newspaper holdings and statements from them, they're concerned about protecting the rights of rights holders. But when push comes to shove, it's mostly about how they make money and their fees. Finally, we have the public. Uh, these are all of us who go to museums. We're only discretionary stakeholders. Uh, we have legitimate concerns because these are artifacts of our own cultural heritage and the public domain doctrine says that we should be able to see and have access to our own culture. But we really don't have a lot of power to change things. We don't directly enact copyright laws. Uh, we vote, but that's a level of abstraction that is so far removed from copyright policy. It doesn't really have an effect. And most of this is so complicated, the public doesn't really understand it or pay attention to it. So there's not a lot of urgency here. Um, Mostly the concern lacks awareness of what the copyright laws or how even museum exhibitions are created. So there's a lot of apathy. Uh, they do have a lot of concerns over infringement because it is in the news and it's loud and it's public. Um, and what they really want is to make sure they can go to museums and kind of see new and fresh cultural works. So what is the current policy? The current policy is based mostly on economics and is the current copyright law. And what it says is that documentary photography is purely a form of copying. So the photographer has no rights. The only person who has rights is a right holder. They can demand credit. They can demand gains. They, have, they can force permissions. According to the law, they control the total and complete use of photographs and the works themselves. The problem is the law is totally complex and, and poorly understood. Educational institutions have some rights under fair use, but those rights are complicated. They're not understood, they're not well laid out, and they're subject to different interpretations from different courts. This creates a number of different consequences. One, the legitimate stakeholders never receive the credit they're looking for. Uh, only at the whim of the museum or the rights holder or someone else will the right credit be attributed for a cultural work or even the photographs of the cultural work. Secondly, exhibitors tend to do whatever they want. They're not worried about infringement. They think that educational fair use gives them the right to do whatever they want. It clearly doesn't, but they believe that it does, and so as a result, they just do whatever they want anyway. Uh, culture, copyright trolls thrive in this environment because nobody understands the copyright laws well enough to prevent them or to fight them, and so they just run around, they collect rent, rents on the copyrighted works um, because people are afraid of being sued. And finally, um, because there's no clear rules, because the rules are vaguely defined, different courts have interpreted them in different ways, and no one really knows what's supposed to go on. So there's an alternate policy that would be based on natural rights as opposed to economic rights. In this policy, creators, documentary photographers, and right holders would always have a right to credit. So they would always have the right to be credited for their work and for their names to appear visibly associated with that work. The economic rights to make money from the works would stay with the person who owns them. So in order to own, in order to make money in any way, shape, or form off this work, documentary photography or otherwise, you would have to have, you would have to own the work. And finally, the exhibitors would not need permission to use that work for educational exhibits in the future. So they could take documentary photography of loaned work, they could use that in future exhibits as long as they're not making money from it. They couldn't put it in gift shop books or other things where they would make money, but they can use it for future exhibitions. As a result of this policy, some, many of the legitimate concerns of stakeholders are taken care of. As you noted before, the primary concern of stakeholders is they want to receive credit. Um, as rights holders, they don't want to lose their economic interests, which would, they would continue to have. The public would have a right to see these cultural works, even in the future, through the use of documentary photography. And the copyright trolls are eliminated from the equation because the policy is simple, clearly understood, and there's no way to use the vagueness to terrorize people. We think this is the preferred method for which documentary photography should be used. So what have we learned? We learned how to apply the stakeholder framework to understand salience of individual stakeholders involved. 
which allowed us to, to craft a policy that addressed their needs. We learned that documentary photography is really a copy. We thought maybe the photographer created something new, but they didn't, according to the law. Copyright law doesn't need to be this vague. I mean, there's, it can be defined better. Um, most stakeholders are not economically motivated. The institutions themselves are really not concerned about being sued like we thought they would be. In fact, they think they have a broad educational mandate to do whatever they want. We got a chance to use, you know, our grounded theory qualitative research stuff. And we got a chance to use a cool new tool. Here are the references and people we cited for this work. 